We've got all the art forms today, paintings, music, and even a little wine. That's an art form, isn't it? I think so. I'm Wendy Bounds. Welcome to Off Duty. Les Lieber is a New York City jazz man. He plays the saxophone and is a virtuoso on the penny whistle. Now, how many of us can say that? Even more interesting, though, he's about to turn 100 years old. I am Leslie Lieber, and what I'm doing now is waiting for my 100th birthday on March 16th. I, every Friday, appear uh, playing the saxophone and leading a musical event called Jazz at Noon, which I started in 1965. I play the saxophone, and that's my main uh, preoccupation, uh, avocation, and occupation. Taking care of my wife is the other. When I was 13 or 14, uh, there was born inside of me an interest in music. I used to hum a lot when I was growing up, and my mother would say, what are you humming? Because I was improvising, and I didn't know it. And along the way, I heard of a tune called Piccolo Pete, was made uh, by a flute player playing a penny whistle. And I immediately went to the music store and bought myself a penny whistle, and I now have a penny whistle that's been around me for the last 35 years, and uh, I suppose uh, that, that has brought me into music, which enabled me uh, to play, uh, you know, with Benny Goodman and, of course, with uh, Django Reinhardt in Paris, who never had played with a penny whistle before, but didn't seem to have any aversion to it, and in fact, he seem to appreciate it. I took this picture of Django playing for children outside of his gypsy caravan uh, when uh, this was during the war, when we got to Paris. I wrote this article in a national magazine on the fact that he was coming over to America, gypsy genius. Look, I, I'm not uh, in love with the penny whistle. Uh, I play the penny whistle, uh, I play the saxophone, but a hundred virtuosos play the saxophone, uh, but uh, I have no competition that I know of unless I stir some up and I'm suddenly confronted by them as a result of this interview. And what better way to enjoy jazz than with a little wine? Fortunately, we've got Letty Teague here with a little insight into everyone's favorite Argentinian export, the Malbec. Hi, I'm Letty Teague. I'm the wine columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and I'm here at Union Square Wine and Spirits to talk about Malbec from Argentina. Malbec is the great grape of Argentina. Um, it is, of course, a great grape of France as well, which is where it originated, but it, it really was put on the map by uh, Argentine winemakers. And I would say probably it's in the last 10 years or so that it's become one of the most popular wines in this country. There are a lot of, a lot of very attractively um, priced Malbecs, and that's, that's you know, key to its popularity. That you can get really good, really consistent wines for about $10, $12. A good Malbec is, is very lush and ripe and dense, um, has a fair amount of alcohol but not overpowering, and so it's versatile and um, basically delicious. 
The father of Malbec um, is this man, um, Nicolas Catania. Even though, of course, he wasn't the only one making uh, um, great Malbecs in the past 20 years, but he has certainly been at the forefront of Argentine wine quality. And, uh, and I think he was, he was named the Decanter Man of the Year um, and has it on his label. Um, so, which is to say he's a very famous man and, and highly recognized for his accomplishments. Um, nobody realizes this in, in the larger world that uh, grapes have been planted in Argentina for a very long time, but it was really with the advent of Malbec in the, uh, in the late 90s and I would say even 10 years ago that he and just about everyone else began planting furiously and making Malbec and of course making it the popular wine that it is today in this country. In fact, Malbec accounts for the vast majority of, of imports to the United States uh, from Argentina and there's a good reason for that. There are also winemakers coming from all over the world to, to invest in Argentina and that's a key factor I think in the success of, of Malbec. You have winemakers like Michel Roland who uh, actually has his own project in Argentina and um, Claude de la Siette. And I think the fact that there's still so much investment on the part of uh, um, winemakers within the country and winemakers and vintners outside the country is key to Argentine Malbec's current success and certainly key to its, its future world dominance. Now you may have caught his song Wave and Flag during the 2012 FIFA World Cup in South Africa. It was the anthem of the tournament. And now our own Chris Farley, he sits down with music sensation k -Nan. I'm here with rapper k who has a new EP out called More Beautiful Than Silence. Now tell me, why did you decide to release a sort of shorter album like this? Uh, you know, it was a... Uh, it was uh, somebody else's smart idea. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't really know the, the mechanics behind it, but I, I think they wanted to give a preview of what the music I've been making is. Um, and the, the full-length album comes out in the spring. Now, now, your background is you were born in Somalia. You moved when you were a teen abroad, and you live? In, uh, yeah, Toronto, New York. Um, but yeah, I, I've always kind of moved around. and. But Somalia has been f musically what has made the real mark on my on my life. The one thing I found interesting is I read that you have sort of an interesting take on Somali piracy. And it's obviously something that's been very much in the news. Uh, pirates operating off the coast of Somalia, mm. sometimes affecting international shipping. Um, some some people in the world see that as a threat, but you s you think that there's other explanations as to why that may be happening. Well, I also agree that it is a threat. I mean, it, and it is a problem and. Um, but the problem is more so for the Somali people than for anybody else. I think that when a n nation is struggling to this degree and we forget them and uh, there are people without a central government for the past 20 years and, uh, you know, incredibly uh, difficult conditions of war, or famine, these kids go into the water and y y for the kind of, you know, odds to be in that ocean and to, to consider losing your life. I mean, we have, to, we have to figure out what is wrong, what is vomiting these kids into the water. And the new EP features Nelly Furtado, who will also be on your upcoming album, yeah. um, which also has a lot of other sort of music stars from around the world. Tell me a bit about that. Uh, well, I've just been very fortunate to work with some great uh, artists that I love and some legends uh, like uh, Bono and uh, Keith Richards and uh, Nas also who's a great hero of mine. It's just, I think the album is just kind of one of those eclectic moments in music that I'm kind of known for has always been just jumping around different areas of sound. When I get older, I will be now one of your biggest hits was a song Waving flag, uh, which was heard around the world. It's soccer matches. I mean, it's hard to escape the song. And why would you want to? It's a great song. Mm, thanks. But it also made some news when Mitt Romney, who's a presidential candidate for Republicans in the U.S., used it during his campaign. How did you feel about that? And what did you? What action did you take when you found out he was using the song? Well, I, I simply just asked uh, for the campaign to stop using my song. I mean, I just thought it was a. For me, it was a contextual issue to use my song um, uh, in that uh, kind of, you know, uh, concept was a problem for me. Just because, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with people of all walks of life being fans of my work. But um, when you're saying, uh, you know, that you're not very concerned w with the poor. The album you have coming out is Country, God, 
or the girl, and you have an EP out right now, More Beautiful Than Silence. Thanks a lot, great Thanks. to see you. Now, I don't know if it's art, but I like it. Now, how many of us have said that when shopping for something to hang on the walls? It doesn't have to be that way. Kelsey Hubbard, she sat down with the experts to find out exactly what we should be looking for when shopping for high-end art. Have you ever wanted to buy a piece of art but just not known how to get started? Or perhaps you're a seasoned collector and want that signature piece? Well, I'm Kelsey Hubbard and I'm here with Andrea Cashman. She's the director of the Andrea Rosen Gallery in New York with some tips on how we can choose art. And, you know, let's start with the beginners who are just starting out because it can be very intimidating sure. to know where to go, what to buy. So what are the first steps they need to know to get started? I mean, I think one of the first things, and, and my advice would be not to be intimidated, there's a wealth of resources, especially for people in New York, to come to a gallery, come to all of the galleries in Chelsea, Lower East Side, the ones uptown, and um, to not be afraid to ask questions. You know, the great thing about a gallery is you can come in, you can look, you can take from it what you want, you can walk in and walk out immediately if it doesn't strike you uh, visually from, from the get-go. So what would be the key piece of advice before someone buys that first piece of artwork? What, what are, you, are you looking for, which is what your personal taste is? Should you take into consideration the resale value perhaps down the road? Uh, what, what should people be thinking about? You know, my advice for someone starting out is to collect what you love. Um, and that means learning. You know, that means uh, in order to have an eye in, in you know, looking at, at, at visual art, it's just as literature or uh, music, the more you know, the more you'll be able to see and understand. I think one of the best resources actually, in fact, um, for someone in that position is also to go to an art fair because that affords you, um, you know, a space. You can see works of, from galleries in Rome and China um, and, it, and it gives you an opportunity to uh, talk with each of those gallerists and really get a sense for what you like on an even more international scale. This is a work by uh, David Altmid, who is an incredible sculptor um, working with plaster here. This is a piece called Wave. Um, and, you know, David's really uh, interested in um, sort of the architecture of, of the body and architecture of the space. So here, you know, in this almost sort of frieze motif of three panels, he's created this incredible sort of gesture that emulates a wave, but is also really about um, dealing with the, with the space in the sense that the hands are sort of both creating and sort of destroying the work itself. What about commission pieces? Do collectors often want to uh, meet an artist and perhaps collaborate on something in the future, or is that not, not really how it works? I mean, I think collaboration maybe not so much because the artist, you know, has their singular vision and a seasoned collector will really want to respect that. Um, but, you know, if there is a particular person who, say, has a new outdoor space and is interested in, you know, an outdoor sculpture, that may be an opportunity for them to approach an artist that they trust, that they rely on, that they um, really, you know, follow their work in, in depth and to um, ask them to do something in a, in a sort of new outdoor context or in a, in a new material to the artist. So that can, that can be a right situation, certainly. And because it's Friday, we have a great one-on-one -on -one with our pop and rock critic Jim Fusilli. He sat down with Italian trumpeter Enrico Rava and they talked about his music and the history of New York jazz. This is Jim Fusilli and I'm here with the Italian jazz master Enrico Rava. Enrico's in town to perform music from his new album, Tribe. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, good, good to, to see, see you. Everybody. I'm, so, I'm so glad to meet you. Uh, I've loved your work for a long time, and I want to talk about Tribe, but I want to talk about your album, New York Days. Yes. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, you lived in New York in the late 60s and early 70s. Yeah, uh, from 67 to 77. And what was your experience back then? You were a young man. Was it uh, a big classroom for you? Or? Well, uh, first of all, I was very lucky because I came to New York playing in the band of Steve Lacey, that at the time was a very, very respected and still me, but he's dead, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, that opened immediately all the doors you know, to, for me. So I met everybody, I started playing with everybody. It was, I must say, it was easy, I was lucky. Oh. And then uh, after a couple of years, I started recording for ECM, uh, starting touring. And the experience was great, because New York in the late 60s, early 70s, was unbelievable, because all the masters that invented jazz, was still alive and playing everywhere, from Duke Ellington, 
the Coltrane, uh, Armstrong, uh, <laughs> everybody, and Miles, yeah. Thelonious Monk, everybody was. And the free, but the free. And the free, and the free was thing it was Albert Tyler's is there. I was involved in that area, but I like the whole spectrum of jazz, from from New Orleans to the electronics. So for me, it was you know I could go to listen to. Do Ellington, then to Coltrane, then to go to play maybe with Cecil Taylor, and then go to listen to John Coltrane at the Latungi Center, go to rehearse with Ornette Coleman. It was really something unbelievable. Yeah. I find the, the New York Days album to be um, very emotional. Uh, it's it's in, in parts very quiet and very thoughtful. Uh, when you were composing, uh, were you did you transport yourself back to those days? No, no. When I when I write, uh, I, I I write for the musician I know I'm going to play with. So I thought about about how Mark Turner, which is one of my favorite uh, tenor player, I thought about Paul Motion that uh, I, I thought about. You know, so that, that, that so I, I I think the situation in, in which, uh, in my opinion, they could sign sound at their at their best. And that's it for today's WSJ Off Duty. I hope you'll click above to subscribe. Please join me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Wendy Bounds, and I'll see you back here on Monday.